Hey, this is Jeff. Welcome to this edition of After Five, a music, art, and entertainment podcast picking up where my radio show left off. Welcome, everybody. You're tuned into After Five, and I have my next guest with us. We have Mario Rodriguez of the band Smoky Mirror. Welcome to the show, Mario. So the first time I heard Smoky Mirror, the music immediately reminded me of like the great jam bands of the past. So tell us a little bit about forming the band and what your master plan was, Mario. Well, uh, I formed the band um, like towards the beginning of 2016, kind of towards the end of 2015. Um, And I guess the master plan at the time was just to pretty much like have a band that can sort of combine like different uh, musical elements of uh, different genres that uh, I was into at the time, you know, like uh, the jammy sort of uh, progressive stuff. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, like uh, that sort of thing. Um, at the time I was playing drums in a different band uh, and kind of wasn't as fulfilled with uh, like filling that role in a musical group. So uh, I wanted to get back into playing guitar and uh, I, you know, met our bass player around that time, and we were just really inspired by, like, Jimi Hendrix and Black Sabbath sort of stuff, but uh, we wanted to pretty much start a band that was kind of more along the lines of heavy blues rock with uh, something that we could combine elements of, like I said, progressive music with, and uh, that's pretty much where, like, the vision for the band kind of started. Now, the band's going to be releasing their debut album in May, but before we get into that, tell us about playing some of, like, your first shows and what the audiences were like. Uh, So, some of our first shows were kind of a mess. (laughs) We were young and, uh, well, much younger and uh, trying to still figure everything out. But um, uh, eventually, after, you know, a couple of... less than great shows we started to kind of get our act together and um you know early on we were showing a lot of a uh, lot of uh, love and give a lot of good um what's the word i'm looking for like opportunities by other bands that we'd known like locally that had reached like a wider audience and uh so we were able to kind of get in front of pretty good sized crowds uh you know early on and um yeah it was a uh, Kind of a bumpy road towards the beginning, but, you know, eventually we uh, kind of refined our sound and kind of honed in on, on uh, the style that we've pretty much got now. You know, and speaking of first shows, what were, like, some of the first shows you attended? And when was it that you decided, Mario, being a band is something you wanted to do? Well, I, some of the earliest shows that I attended um, were when I was, like at the age of nine and ten, I had um, some cousins of mine that uh, were a lot older, and uh, my cousin and her husband had like a metal band here in Dallas, and they would, uh, you know, put me and my sister, my older sister, uh, who was like 15 at the time, we were like age 10 and 15, and we'd just be like on the guest list at these like all ages clubs to go see our our cousins perform, and um, you know that was like I feel like a really uh, important part of like the uh, pretty much how I first realized, you know, I wanted to play music and like, you know, it was very, uh, like those formative experiences that kind of made me, you know, want to pursue music myself. And, um, from then, you know, I, from the time I was, uh, 13, I was attending metal shows really regularly. Um, I, I was lucky enough to have parents that were supportive of, uh, they weren't musicians themselves, but they could tell, you know, I had an interest, and they supported that interest. They, you know, would take me to shows, drop me off, you know, pick me up, and uh, just kind of help nurture my interest in music. So um, it started very young for me. So, Mara, you had mentioned in your bio that you wanted to make music that's engaging to both casual listeners and the refined ears of musicians. So with that in mind, how did you go about writing this album? time uh just kind of like dissecting like the music that i really like and the stuff that spoke to me kind of getting an idea of like what pulls my attention you know in both ways like as a music enjoyer and as a musician um and kind of just trying to focus in on that um obviously 
obviously there's uh, I, I have a a lot of interest in like progressive music that sometimes tends to lose like broader audiences and you know I'm also interested in bands that have more popular appeal but aren't really quite as like technically proficient or um like uh not as like engaging for like the musical like uh musician sort of ear so that's uh just kind of finding like the middle ground there was just uh like the goal from the beginning and uh just uh, i hard to explain i guess just over time it kind of all just came together so now tell us about recording this and capturing that kind of nostalgic tone while still sounding so listenable. I mean, I read that some of the equipment in the studio was actually formerly owned by Abbey Road Studios, and that was kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. The studio that we recorded at in uh, Palmer, Texas, um, uh, is, uh, is an all-analog studio that, you know, we recorded uh, a large bulk of the album on two-inch tape, and uh, I think that... <laughs> did a lot to help kind of capture the nostalgic sort of feel that we were going for. Um, and the engineer that we worked with was just a phenomenal, phenomenal, uh, brilliant engineer, um, musician as well, like uh, our first Paul Middleton, who a you know, former bass player and singer for uh, Dark Horse. And uh, he just understood, like, the style of music that we were going for. And... Um, you know, he was just uh, very helpful with uh, kind of getting the exact sound that we were going for captured. Now, did you guys face any challenges when writing and recording this album? Yeah, there was a lot of <laughs> a lot of hurdles that we kind of had to jump through. Um, I mean, we like the production sort of started like just before COVID, and so uh, obviously, like the pandemic put a big uh, pause on the the album production for a while and um aside from that uh just there's a lot of nuance and a lot of uh like difficulty that, that goes into uh, there's a lot more attention to detail that goes into recording the analog um that we hadn't really had any experience with before going into it so just kind of getting to understand like how the punch in process works um uh, and uh, just kind of becoming familiar with the gear was uh, also sort of a bit of a learning curve that we had to figure out. Um, but once we kind of, like over time, as uh, you know, the recording sessions went on and we started to kind of understand things better, things definitely ran a lot more smoothly in the end. But there was certainly some uh, some uh, learning curve <laughs> involved. So was this album written like before the pandemic hit? Yeah, yeah. Uh, a few of the songs we were kind of like finishing up uh, during like the recording process, but uh, a few of the, of the, I mean, a good portion of the, of the material was written pre-pandemic, yeah. And now the first single that you guys released off the album is Magic Circle, also the longest song of the album coming in at about eight minutes long, and also has like a cool little drum solo near the end, so why did you want to go with this particular song to introduce everybody to first? Oh, well, we felt like this song kind of uh, showcased everybody like individually in the band. Um, there's a section that sort of allows our bass players kind of like have his own freedom, like his own solo, and then uh, the aforementioned drum solo as well. Uh, it was kind of, a, you know, something that we were like unsure about at first because, like you said, I mean, it is the longest song on the album, and we were kind of wondering, like, is this going to translate well with, like, the audience for, like, for being a lot of people's first introduction to our music? But ultimately, we just decided that, you know, the people who get it will get it, and... Um, you know, uh, it's the best representation of uh, everybody individually and collectively. Uh, so that was kind of our uh, mentality going into it. So now, are any of you guys, like, trained? I mean, did you guys go to music school or anything like that? No, uh, not like, we not really, like, formally trained or mm -hmm. anything. Um, pretty much all of us have been self-taught. Uh, as an adult, like, only in the last, like, year, year and a half, I sort of began taking the steps to, like, actually be taught music theory and take my, like, musical understanding, like, the self-taught understanding that I've developed over years further and 
kind of giving it some formal structure. But uh, but yeah, no, none of us have all, none of us have been like we never went to music school. Uh, we didn't like really like have like any kind of training growing up. Uh, it was just a lot of mostly just like self-taught stuff. And now you guys ended the album with a cool little guitar instrumental called A Recurring Nightmare. So tell us a little bit about that song and why you wanted to end the album that way. Well, that song actually is a piece that, uh, like, the first half of it uh, I composed when I was, like, 15 or 16. Oh, cool. And um, it was just a piece that I always uh, was very proud of and just, you know, felt very strongly about. And then um, that's one of the songs that, like, in the process of, like, recording the album and finalizing everything, uh, like, I just kind of had this spontaneous inspiration and to finish it uh, after, uh, like, 10 years, you know, of uh, playing it to myself. And um, I just felt like it was, a, like, a, a moody, like, interesting way to end the album, you know, on a uh, sort of gloomy note. <laughs> And now there's also like a lot going on on this album cover. Now, in the promo sent to me, I see like just the cover, but does it kind of continue on the back or inside or something? Yeah, there's, you know, it's, it's a front and back cover. Uh, it's like two uh, pieces. Like that we, we hired an artist here in Dallas, a uh, very well-known artist here locally. Uh, his name is Clay Stinnett, and uh, his artwork can be found in pretty much all the, most of the bars, like, uh, certainly most of the bars that we play in, like, you know, similar, like, adjacent bands, like, the spaces that we occupy in, in uh, Dallas' entertainment district, Deep Ellum, um, you know, his work can be found everywhere, and he's, uh, he's a, a wonderful artist that we've known for many years, and um, we just kind of, he works really well with suggestion, and, you know, we, we had, like, a vision in mind of just having, like, a really, like, busy sort of eyeful kind of uh like album covers some of the inspiration that we were drawing from is like the inside cover of uh almond brothers eat a peach oh yeah you know just like a lot of a lot going on and like you know some like kind of artwork that you can like look at multiple times and find something new each time and so uh yeah did you have any input into that at all, though? Like, hey, why don't you put this thing here or put this drum set here or anything like that? Yeah, yeah. We, we like, sent him a long list of, <laughs> just, like, gorilla with chainsaw hands and, like, a, a bloodhound with a Tommy gun and a volcano and, like, you know, giant monsters from, like, you know, Japanese kaiju films. And, uh, and he just pretty much, like, ran with it. And he pretty much just, like, Use the list that we sent him as like a checklist in in the process of making the album art, and he, uh, yeah, he, I'd say he did a fine job. It is, and it is really fun. And and I had to actually go to your social medias to find the other half of the of the art, and I was like so happy because it just continued on with all these bizarre things like you were mentioning, and it's and it and it kind of really does fit. The music, too, you know what I mean? Just with, like, the colors and all this crazy stuff going on. Kind of like your music, Mario. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's, I, I would like to think that it was, it's uh, pretty fitting to our sound as well. <laughs> and now, now, why did you guys decide to, to self-title your debut album? Oh, um, just because I guess I feel like it's, uh, like, our first, like, full, complete work. And, um... You know, it's just a uh, representative of, you know, years of uh, a style that we've kind of developed. So it just, it seemed appropriate, like, it seemed, uh, fitting to make it like a self-titled release. Um, just, yeah, like on that basis. Now, again, the debut self-titled album from Smoky Mirror releases on May 5th off Rise Above Records. So do you guys have a, like a special album release show planned? Now, in closing, Mario, if people want to keep up with the band to learn more about you guys or see where you're playing or pick up some merch, what are the best sites for them to go so, to? go to? We're pretty good about keeping our Instagram account active. Uh, the screen name is just 
Smokey, Mirror, TX, all one word. And uh, that's where we keep a lot of our update information for shows and, uh, like, our upcoming tour. Um, you know, pretty much everything uh, that we're up to, you know, we, we keep on there. And then Facebook, you know, we've gotten better about keeping that uh, updated. But uh, that's definitely where we would advise people to go if they wanted to keep up with us and see, you know, what we have going on. So there you guys go. Smokey Mirror has new album releasing May 5th. And Mario, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. And we wish you and the band all the best. Thank you so much. It was a great, uh, great interview. I'm glad that we could uh, talk about the album.